Okay, fantastic. Thanks everyone for joining us today. I want to give you a big warm welcome to today's webinar, which is focused on identifying patients and groups online to grow your rare disease community. Uh, my name's Libby and I'm the patient group development manager at Findacure and I'm going to be exploring this topic with you today. So, um, in today's webinar, I'm going to do a very brief introduction to Find a Cure for those who are new to the charity before delving into the subject at hand. Um, this is going to include uh, an introduction to the topic of growing your rare community and the specific niche we're looking at today, which is identifying places where you can signpost to your organisation online. Um, we're going to start with um, rare disease specific platforms before looking into how you can use mainstream media to identify more specific places to signpost from and then cover some of the reg regulatory and ethical uh, considerations around the topic. Um, today's patient group is aimed, sorry, today's webinar is aimed at new patient groups who um, are pretty new to the idea of growing their patient group online and perhaps already don't have um, a large or a, st a strong presence online as well as those who are hoping to pick up new skills in online searching. Uh, the aim of the webinar is to make you aware of the different platforms that are out there and how you can use them to grow your groups. The information we're covering um, is going to be um, probably quite um, basic. So if you're looking for some more advanced information, you're more than welcome to contact me after the webinar has finished. and We can discuss more about your needs. Uh, throughout the webinar, um, it would be fantastic to see everyone getting involved and interacting with what I'm saying. If you have any ideas or comments, please let us know in the chat box, which is in the webinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and I will do my best to include your comments in the discussion. Similarly, if you have any questions, please do type them in the question box. Depending on what they say and when I see them, I'll either answer them there and then or save them until the end. Um, I'm certainly not an expert in the, this area. I think um, I'm mostly just kind of sharing what I've picked up and researched through my time at Finder and want to share with you all. So if there's any questions that I can't answer, um, I'm more than happy to write them down and get in touch with you privately afterwards and do some more research together. Um, the webinar should take about 45 minutes in total, including a little bit of time for questions. Fantastic. So um, as I said, I just want to quickly introduce Finder Cure for those who are new to us. So Find a Cure is a UK registered charity and our vision is a world in which all rare diseases have treatments made together with patients for patients. And we're working towards this vision through two key aims, empowering patient groups um, like yourselves to be change makers in your own rare diseases and by building a collaborative rare disease community where everyone, including patient groups, academics, researchers, life science professionals, uh, are all working together towards the same common goals. We run a range of projects to achieve these aims. So to empower patient groups, we provide a range of training opportunities, including these webinars, but also in-person workshops, an annual peer mentoring program, and a free e-learning portal. Um, all of these projects are free, and anyone with an interest in rare diseases is welcome to join us. And um, to build a rare disease community, we organize conferences and showcases, which bring together all rare disease stakeholders into the same room to highlight each other's progress and ce celebrate excellence in research, but also to discuss challenges and see how we can overcome them together. And we also run a student voice essay competition to encourage medical students to think about their rare diseases, uh, sorry, to think about rare diseases in their early training. And we would love it if you could join us at um, one of our upcoming events. So um, we've currently got three in the calendar. The first is the Cambridge Residency Showcase on Thursday, 8th of August. This is an evening networking event. Um, there'll be food and drink, uh, plenty of networking time, and also um, the networking is going to be divided up by lightning talks given by audience members. Um, if you want to pitch for a lightning talk slot, you can do so when you register until the 17th of July. Um, and then we'll select around uh, six or so to be delivered on the night. And it's completely free for patient groups and advocates to attend, £10 for academics and researchers and £20 for um, life science professionals. Um, secondly, we've got a, a workshop coming up which will focus on patient registries on Tuesday 17th of September. We don't currently have a registration form open for this, so for now please just save the date and there should be some more information and a registration form um, sent out I think next week. And then our Manchester Red Disease Showcase will be on Tuesday 8th of October. 
Um, this will be a day-long event, almost like a conference, and we'll be hearing talks from those involved in rare diseases across the Northwest. Um, it's going to be a fantastic day. We've already had lots of people sign up, and we've got lots of free exhibition stands for patient groups as well. So if you're interested at all, please do get in touch. You can find out more about any of our upcoming events on our website at www.findacure.org.uk forward slash events. Fab, so now on to the topic at hand, growing your patient community. So um, when we say growing um, your patient community, what we mean is increasing the number of patients who are directly connected with your patient group. Um, you might count this through, for instance, um, the number of members you have in an online group, such as a Facebook group, or you might record it more officially through a membership list or even a patient registry. Um, but why would you want to grow your patient community? Well, the answer may, may seem obvious, and each of you will probably have your own specific reasons, but I just want to run through a few ideas here. So generally speaking, the main idea is so that you can have a bigger impact. The more people you have in your community, the larger the impact you can have through your projects and services. Another reason is that the more people that are involved in your community, the more likely it is that you'll find people willing to help you run the patient group and fundraise for you, again, giving you a bigger impact. Um, the third and unfortunately um, for rare conditions, larger patients are, uh, generally speaking, more attractive to researchers on both financial and practical grounds. Financial because there'll be more people to sell any treatment or intervention to and practically because it can be difficult to prove statistically significant research outcomes in small cohorts. So by building a larger rare community yourself, you can become a gatekeeper to your community and a valuable research partner. And finally, density. Um, we all know how beneficial meeting face to face with other patients and families can be. And the more people you have in your community, uh, the more sort of like geographical concentrations they'll start to be. Um, so it becomes easier for members to meet um, one another face to face or even hold um, several local sort of localized meetups. So um, how can you grow your patient community? There are lots of ways you can go about growing your patient community. Um, on this slide, we're going to give a little bit of an overview before introducing the niche area we're going to focus on today. So I've split the different activities into two categories. The first is building a presence and the second is signposting your services. There's a lot of overlap between the two, but the key distinction is ownership. So in building a presence, you've got things like hosting your website, um, your social media, uh, your contacts and your own networks, including healthcare professionals. All of these things are, to a large degree, owned and controlled by you. Um, signposting to your services um, includes um, signposts on online platforms, such as other organizations, websites and social media, um, press releases, Google ads, advertising or exhibiting at conferences, and signposts in healthcare services or information, which could ultimately involve healthcare professionals referring to you. These are all things that you don't necessarily own or have full control over and there may be restrictions on how you can use them or there might be some gatekeepers to work with. So that's kind of the distinction I've got there between the two categories. And um, today's webinar is going to focus on the first part of signposting circled in red. So um, signposting on on online platforms such as other organisations, websites and social media. We've chosen this area because we haven't done any live training on it um, previously. Um, obviously, the other activities in the table are still really important. And um, in particular, you might find that the more you build your own presence, the less you'll have to do in signposting because you're already easier to find, which is why I kind of said at the beginning, it's more for patient groups, um, this webinar, who haven't um, necessarily got a large or strong online presence right now. Um, we've done lots of training on building your um, own presence previously, and you can find lots of resources on our e-learning portal. Um, and the relevant courses there are communications and branding and raising awareness among healthcare professionals. Um, both um, very interesting courses, and if you have any further questions about them, I'm more than happy to help. Just pop me an email afterwards. Um, so for the rest of the webinar, we're going to focus on the different places you can signpost from. We'll start with the more obvious rare disease platforms and then cover how you can strategically search for other places that are more specific to your organization. 
Um, importantly, the webinar is going to focus a lot less on finding and targeting individual patients and families because there are some pretty tight regulations around this. However, we are going to take a look at these regulations and our interpretation of them and discuss when and how it might be appropriate to reach out to an individual patient or family towards the end of the webinar as well. Um, also, before I go any further, I just want to say that every rare disease is uh, different in terms of the information that's out there and the activity of your wider community. So the things I'm highlighting today might really work well for some of you, but not for others of you. And hopefully, in just making you aware of what's out there, I'll just come up with some ideas you can shape for you and your group. So, um, signposting online, why do it? So, firstly, um, it improves your um, searchability on a global scale. It puts you on the world wide web, making it easy to find you and to just be aware of you. Um, when people are aware of you, you can then signpost them back to your own organization. So this includes patients, family members, but also healthcare professionals who might be searching for a patient group um, to support a newly diagnosed family. And um, so it's really important that um, the more, basically, the more places you're in, the more likely it is that these people will find you and be signposted back to your organisation. Um, so, yeah, so it, it raises awareness about your organisation and means that ultimately, if people like what they see, you can grow your patient community. Um, on this note, I just wanted to say that um, before you start doing these sorts of activities, we would really recommend that you have... Um, a website or something like a Facebook group to link to and that on whatever you're linking to there is a clear way for people to get involved and perhaps more importantly a clear message of the benefit they can get from doing so. Um, the way they could get involved could simply be joining an online group, it could be signing up to a newsletter, it could be registering as a member or getting involved in a patient registry but it's important to have a clear and simple way that people um, can kind of get involved and stay interested straight away. So um, where do you actually want to signpost your services from? So the good news is that there are already a lot of rare disease specific um, databases, online forums and membership lists um, that you can add yourselves to, which will make you more searchable. So we'll start with databases. So there is a surprising number of um, rare disease databases out there. Um, and the collection that I'm going to go through in a minute is far from complete. But the ones that I've chosen are um, on there because they're some of the most popular ones and because they also have lists of patient groups working in each specific rare disease. So they make good starting points, easy, sort of low hanging fruit for where you can add yourselves to. Uh, the first one is Orphanet. So Orphanet is a European based huge database of all the rare diseases, orphan drugs, healthcare professionals, expert centres, and so on. They also have a director of patient organisations, and it's free to add yourself to this, providing you are a patient organisation or network dedicated to a particular rare disease or group of rare diseases. And you must also have a legal status, such as being a registered charity or foundation. And I'll show you how easy it is to add yourself to this in a moment. Um, the next four are all American-based. And while I couldn't find exact information um, about who can be included in the list of organisations. They seem to be open to any organisation around the world offering to support patients for that specific rare disease. Um, and finally, I've added Contact2. Um, so Contact is a charity which provides information, advice and support services for families with disabled children. They have an A to Z of rare and common conditions and it seems to be that they really welcome any patient groups getting in touch to be added to um, uh, as a kind of reference point within the A to Z of diseases um, to refer families to. Um, so now to add a bit more of a practical element to the webinar, I'm just going to show you how you can actually physically add yourselves to just a couple of these um, databases. So we're going to look at Orphanet and the NIH Guard. Fantastic. So you should all now be able to see um, the Orphanet platform. So this is the European platform. Um, which is, has a huge database of um, rare diseases, orphan drugs, um, healthcare professionals, expert centres and so on. And it also has, um, which we're mostly interested in today, a director of patient organisations. 
So if you click on the directory, you can type in a disease name. So for instance, if I type in ask, oh, ask oh, syndrome as an example, Um, you can see that there are a few different ones, but we're after the Arscog Scott syndrome one. And here you can see that there are 48 results of all the patient organizations that might be able to help people um, living with Arscog Scott syndrome. So some of them are specific to Arscog Scott, such as this um, German group here, but others are more like umbrella rare disease organizations or umbrella health charities that it would kind of fall into as being a place for support. So how do you actually add yourself to this? So if we go back to the Orphanet homepage and we scroll down, we can see a little section here that says um, contribute to Orphanet. And here you click register your activity. Um, this takes you to a page and it looks like it's only for professionals and institutions, but it's not. Um, anyone can add their activity through this um, format. So you click um, Orphanet Online Registration Service here. And here you can make a free account, absolutely free to do so here, or you can log in um, using your login details. And I've already logged in here. So this is my personal page on Orphanet. And here I can click to register a new activity. There we go. Um, so then you select um, patient organizations, umbrella organizations and alliances, because that's what you want to add and click OK. Then you have to read the eligibility, eligibility criteria and the terms and conditions and so on. And once you've done that, you click I, I agree and press OK. And then here, there's a form that you can fill in to tell them everything about your organization and that they can get it uploaded for um, in the relevant places on their database. So that's hopefully a quick and easy way to um, sort of immediately increase your visibility online. Um, we're also going to look at the um, NIH Guard, which is an American one, but it's one of the most complete um, residues databases out there. Um, and um, they do welcome overseas national patient groups to add themselves to the list. So for instance, if I give the example of acrodisostosis, um, you click on the relevant disease. And here you see lots of information about the disease, its symptoms, diagnosis, and so on. And you can scroll down to the section about organizations. So there you can see there's already one organization in the list. Um, but if you click here, you can add your own organizations. Um, and here, this is um, a lot simpler than the um, Orphanet one. All you have to do is tell them about the patient group that you would like to add to their website. And we'd recommend adding, sending them the information that they have about all the other organizations that are already on there. So for instance, your name, your address, your web link, and so on. Um, and we'd also recommend clicking yes, that they can respond to you in case, um, they end up, in case you end up missing any details or they want to find out more information. Um, so yeah, so those are just two of the platforms where you can add yourself quite easily um, as a patient group. Um, so we'll just start the slides again. Uh, fantastic. So um, another type of platform you can signpost from is online forums. Um, and the ones on this slide are just some of the many that are specific to rare diseases. Um, rare Connect and Ben's Friends are both platforms that are made up of many different online forums for specific rare diseases. And patients like me are similar, but it's for both common and rare conditions. Um, but how can you actually use these to signpost to your organization? Well, first of all, um, you can check if there's already a forum for your rare community on these platforms. And if there is, you can post it to let people know that you exist and how they can find out more about you. 
If there isn't a forum already for your rare condition, you can get in touch with the overall platform and ask about starting one. If you're able to do one, um, this would then be owned and run by your organization, which means that you're um, quite directly searchable and it also means that you can grow your patient group directly through it. So there's lots of good things that can come out of um, starting an online community on these platforms. Um, another one I just wanted to highlight is Rare Revolution magazine. Um, this is a umbrella rare disease Facebook group. It doesn't have separate channels for different rare diseases like the other forums, um, but there might be people living with um, your condition in there because it's a rare disease umbrella platform who might not have heard of you before. So it's always worth kind of interacting with posts on that sort of thing and making people on that platform aware that you exist. Um, but a word of warning, if you are posting on um, online forums that are owned and controlled by other people, we'd recommend that you always check with the administrator before promoting your organization um, because there could be some political issues there. Um, fab. So um, the third category for the rare disease specific platforms is membership lists. And these are public lists that umbrella rare disease organizations have of all their members. Generally speaking, other than the Genetic Disorders UK partnership network, um, it costs money to be a member of these, um, though the exact cost is uh, tends to be based on your organization's income. Um, membership um, has a lot of bonuses. It means you've got extra searchability. It means you've got extra credibility. And there are plenty of other membership benefits that come with each of them. Um, but it's up to you to decide whether you would like to join and weigh up the cost versus the benefits. Um, there are plenty more membership lists. These are just a few that I've pulled out. Excellent. So we've covered some of the popular umbrella rare disease platforms where you can signpost to your organization and increase how searchable you are. Um, but every rare disease is different. So now we're going to switch the emphasis to searching for more places which are more specific to your rare disease. So what are we searching for? Um, first of all, and most obviously, we want to be searching for other organizations set up for our rare disease. You probably already have a good grasp of the other groups that are out there. But a few times when I've been working more directly with patient groups, we've really delved into some of the mainstream media platforms and found other sort of really informal groups that they weren't aware of previously. So it's always worth trying the sorts of things I'm going to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so. Um, we're also going to be looking for umbrella organizations which your group fits into for instance larger and more generic charities um that your rare disease um for like may fit into um and then we're also going to be looking for organizations which operate in frequently misdiagnosed areas so this term sounds a bit clunky i wasn't really sure how best else to put it but what I mean is other conditions which patients who have your rare condition are often misdiagnosed as having before getting their final diagnosis. So this point probably won't apply for conditions where diagnosis is straightforward. But if you know that your patients are frequently misdiagnosed as having something else before diagnosed with your rare condition, it might be worth reaching out to organizations related to those and seeing if you could add um, some information or a signpost to your organization. If you're unsure whether you have any frequently misdiagnosed areas and what they are, it might be worth mapping out patients' journeys to diagnosis to identify common, common cluster points. And this can be sort of a new sort of project or initiative in and of itself. Patient mapping can take a while to do it well. So, um, and if you want to find out more about that, then definitely get in touch. Um, and where are we searching? Oh, oh sorry, and organisations set up for similar rare diseases. Um, so where are we searching? Um, there are lots of different places that you can search online, but I'm going to focus on three main ones, Google, Facebook and Twitter. Um, and now we're going to look at how you can best utilise these platforms to find other groups you can signpost from. So how are we searching from Google? 
Well, this might seem pretty obvious to you. You enter a search term and you press enter, but we do have a few extra tips for how you search. So the first is searching for your rare disease and seeing which sites appear above your own website in the results list. For whatever reason, the websites that appear above you are more popular or of higher quality than your own. So seeing if there's any way to signpost from them to your own website might help you to streamline where you actually add signposts because signposting can be quite a time consuming activity. Obviously, this isn't the only way to appear higher up the list. Google bases it on all sorts of measures. So you do also need to focus on building a high quality online presence. And as I mentioned before, we've got some guides on our portal for this and you're more than welcome to get in touch um, to ask some more about that. Our second tip is searching for symptoms. So taking the disease name out of your search terms and just searching for symptoms. This way you might find people discussing their or their child's symptoms publicly in online forums and you can perhaps send them a link to your own website and um, they will discuss more about some of the ethics around this and how you can actually make the approach later. Um, thirdly, you can filter for news. So when you do a Google search, you can select what type of search you have and one of those is a new search and here you might find out about other groups or people who've been publicly active in your rare disease. Um, and if you want to take this one step further, you can sign up for Google Alerts. So these are um, little news bulletins that you get to your inbox um, either every day or every week, depending on the frequency, for a range of search terms. So you can see the search terms that I've gotten here under the My Alerts list, um, a whole range of them, and you can create new alerts by putting them in the Create an Alert About box. And that way you can get news directly to your inbox every day about different search terms related to your rare condition. This can help you with all sorts of things, just knowing more about your rare condition around the world or giving you some good articles to sort of include in your communication strategy. Um, but um, it can also be used to try and find out about um, more specific people and groups around the world. Um, so through particularly filtering for news and Google Alerts, you might find out about um, more specifically about like individuals and families who've been affected and again we'll come on to how you actually reach out to them um, in the ethics and regulatory part at the end. So in a similar way to Google you can also enter search terms into Facebook and Twitter. So when you do this on Facebook you see a list of results related to the search term but our tip is to um, filter the results specifically for pages and groups across the top bar. This will give you a list of all the Facebook pages and groups from the very informal to those that belong to um, sort of really established charities um, that are related to your rare condition. There might be none, there might be loads. It really depends on how active your wider community is online. And this is where, when I said before, when I was working more directly with patient organizations, this is where we found those really informal groups that were just of, of a small number of people sort of um, dotted around the globe. So it's uh, perhaps worth a try. Um, the same goes for Twitter. So you can tw um, filter Twitter for people and this gives you a list, a list of all the individuals and organizations that are publicly related to your rare condition. So any organizations you identify through this um, can be good places to signpost from. You could perhaps pop them a message and ask them to do a post about you or to include a link to you, um, perhaps in like their pinned um, post or something. Um, but undoubtedly, when you search them, you'll come across some individual people or families who are affected by your rare disease who you might not already be in touch with. Um, and indeed, on Facebook itself, you can actually filter for people and for posts, as you'll see on that top bar. So it can be very tempting to reach out to these people, but there are some legal regulations, particularly around data protection and marketing, which control how you can do this. And we'll discuss those in a few minutes. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to um, cover some best practice points when it comes to actually approaching other organizations you've not been in touch with before, because there are some potential political and data protection issues around this. So um, it does depend on exactly what you're doing and where you, online you're doing it, but hopefully you can apply some of these pointers to your specific situation. 
So we would say when you're approaching other organisations, it's important to be professional. This will help you to come across as a reputable and legitimate organisation. And ultimately, if an organisation is going to signpost to you, they need to know that you're trustworthy because they don't want to be sending people in their group the wrong way. Um, it's always worth trying to establish a collaborative relationship. What can you offer them in return for helping you? Um, by figuring this out and kind of putting more of a proposal in place, this might mean that the organisations are more likely to say yes to adding a signpost to your website, um, but it could also spark a positive relationship for future collaboration too. Um, if you're sending them information to upload to their own website, ask what format and content they would like and produce something that fits this. Don't expect them to do the research in order to write about you. If you're directly emailing people at an organisation, you should use publicly available contact details. And if you're joining an organisation's private online forum or group, you should disclose you're from another organisation and ask for the admin's permission before actively promoting the group. And also be aware here um, of any uh, specific group or forum rules. And finally, you should not be recording any personal information about any members of any other group or your own group without their explicit and recorded consent. So these are our top tips that we have for when you're approaching other groups, asking them to signpost to your organisation. But as I mentioned before, sometimes when you're searching for groups, you might come across some individual people or families affected by your rare disease. And um, whether you can reach out to them and how you do so is regulated in particular by GDPR. So this is the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, which came into force last year, and it's very, very much in force right now. Um, and because of this, you should only be reaching out to individual families and patients when it is regulatory and ethically appropriate to do so. So, um, the Information Commissioner's Office, or ICO, is the public body which oversees compliance to data protection regulations in the UK, and they provide a lot of advice on their website. I've tapped into their direct marketing guidance and pulled out some of the key points so we can explore this topic a little bit more, and I've highlighted the important parts in pink. So the first thing to be aware of is that reaching out to in individuals to promote your organisation counts as direct marketing. Direct marketing is the communication of any advertising or marketing material which is directed to particular individuals. This definition covers any advertising or marketing material. It doesn't just mean commercial marketing, so it applies to approaching individual families and patients. And just re-clarifying that it's, it's a marketing that's directed at particular individuals that's included in this definition. So direct marketing is not limited to advertising goods and services. It also includes promoting an organization's aims and ideals. And the ISO specifies that not-for-profit organizations need to be aware that the definition of direct marketing will cover any messages that contain marketing elements, even if this is not the main purpose of the message. So we've covered what direct marketing is, but why does that matter to us? So this matters because organizations can only send marketing text to individual, uh, marketing text or emails to individuals if that person has specifically consented to receiving them. The same rules apply to any electronically stored messages, such as email, text, and social networking messages. And the ISO also says that organizations must, must not disguise or conceal their identity in any marketing text or emails. And we've interpreted this to mean that you, as an individual person, cannot get around these regulations by promoting your organization through your own personal name. So if I, um, as Libby Reed, I can't get around these regulations by promoting Find Cure in my own name. As soon as I'm promoting Find Cure, the same regulations apply. This isn't to say that you can't use your own personal name, but if you are doing so, you must disclose you are from your organisation and adhere to the rules. So what does all of this mean in terms of actually approaching people? 
So before I run through the points, I just want to say that this is very much how we have interpreted the ICO guidance. We've pulled out the key messages, but we would highly advise that you go and read the guidance to familiarise yourself with it and check how it applies to your specific situation. So firstly, it means that you should not privately message anyone you don't have explicit and recorded consent to contact. However, you can respond publicly to public discussions, such as those that are taking place in online forums or public Facebook groups. Um, and um, we would say, remember to be professional if you're doing so, and um, if you're using your own name to disclose that you are acting on behalf of a specific organization. Feel free to publicly give them your contact details, but don't over pursue or harass them to contact you. And um, this whole point can even stretch to those who have explicitly invited um, contact. So for instance, if someone shares their contact details on a blog and encourage people to get in touch, that's absolutely fine to do so, but you should not direct message them in any of these circumstances. Um, if you're responding, do it publicly on a forum. Um, however, on this, it's important to be aware that even if a post is technically public, this may not be intentional. This particularly applies to things like Facebook statuses, where someone might not have their privacy settings set up how they intended them to be um, set up. Um, in this case, we'd say it's really important to use common sense and think about the purpose of their post. Was it directed at their family and friends, or was it asking um, for help from the wider social media community about their rare disease? You may not be doing anything legally wrong by responding, but it could be considered ethically wrong because they're an expectation of privacy and we would advise that you err on the side of caution with this. Um, and finally, just a point to say that if you find a news article talking about um, a patient or a family, we, we would say that the best way to try and reach out to them is to contact the journalist or news site and ask them to pass your details on, but you should not Google the names of the family and find direct contact details for them. In all cases, making contact should be through the route that you found them or came across them. We realise this approach might seem overcautious, and you might think that if it were you, you'd be happy to hear from an organisation that wants to help you. But you can't say that about everyone, and there might be a reason already that they haven't contacted you. So you cannot use a kind of general well-meaningness as a reason to kind of ignore the rules. Um, so if you're reaching out to individuals in the way we've just outlined, we just want to share three golden rules for how you actually go about it. So the first is to be transparent about where you're contacting from. If you're responding to a public post as a, as a parent or patient to give advice, that's absolutely fine. There's nothing stopping you doing that. But as soon as you promote your organisation in any way, you should disclose that you're from the organisation. Um, we would also recommend, um, where possible, that you make approaches through your organization's official channels, um, such as an organizational email address or your organization's social media profile. This means the fact that you're from an organization is already disclosed and it feels more professional. Um, we also recommend that you specify the purpose of your contact and that, generally speaking, this should be giving them the opportunity to engage with your services rather than an overly persuasive pitch to join your group. Um, and to support this, you can give them a web link or contact details to find out more information. Um, and finally, I just want to reiterate that you should not record anyone else's personal details without their recorded consent. And that is advised, oh, sorry, one more point. And, um, there is an expectation of privacy overall and that it's better to err on the side of caution. So um, there is a lot more to GDPR than what I've outlined today. And um, so I've just pulled out the parts that are most relevant to the topic. And if you haven't already done so, we would highly recommend that you head over to the ICO website and familiarise yourself with the guidance. We also have a really excellent talk on um, from a rare disease patient group on how they're meeting GDPR, um, available under the Policies, Strategies, Plans and Governance course on our um, e-learning portal. And I can tell you more about that as well after the webinar if you're interested. Um, GDPR is a really complicated thing and it can feel really overwhelming and trust me, we've been overwhelmed by it for a couple of years as well now. 
Um, however, following it is not is not just important for staying on the right side of the law. It also ensures that you have positive interactions with your community. Because if you show that you respect their privacy, they might be more likely to get involved and trust you with their data moving forward. So, um, in conclusion, uh, growing your patient community can increase your organization's impact, capacity and research attractiveness. One way to grow your patient community is to add signposts to your organization from different online platforms. There are already lots of umbrella reds these platforms, including rare databases, online forums, and membership lists. You can search for more specific platforms, such as other groups working in your area, through Google, Facebook, Twitter, and more. When you're searching, sorry, when you're asking other organizations to signpost you, your approach should be professional and collaborative. And you should only approach individuals when it is appropriate, both regulatory and ethically speaking, to do so and in an appropriate manner. So um, thank you very much again, everyone, for joining in and engaging with what I've been saying here. I hope you found it helpful. Um, please do send any feedback you've got to me. We really want to know how well this webinar has been received and what other training you want. Um, and yeah, I hope you all have a lovely day. <laughs>